Thanks, everybody. And thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, you may have seen in the uh, paper, in the description of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk a bit about um, my interest recently in how games can address climate change. Um, and it may, you know, it, this is pretty new. I'm going to say it's something I have not been working on excessively uh, until really recently. Um, and I want to talk about kind of how I got to thinking about this and why. And um, to do that, I'll, I'll introduce a little bit more of work that I've done up until this point and uh, maybe try to pull it all together. Uh, so, and by the way, this is kind of a, you know, I'm coming out of presentation hibernation of a sort. I'm sure many are right now. I, I looked back and I probably haven't talked in front of, a, you know, a non, an audience that wasn't my own students for like two years. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be fun. And um, so much has changed, obviously, in that time. It has not been an easy time since uh, then. And uh, in fact, it, you know, for a lot of people, reevaluating what they do, I count myself among them. I, uh, uh, you know, certain realities of the world really started to sink in and uh, made me sort of think about, like Christina told me earlier, like it's all hands on deck. What can I do with what I've got to give to the world? And so this is maybe, you know, my first steps toward, toward that. Um, so what about this word exuberant? Does anyone have an idea of not necessarily the definition, but other words that it, other thoughts that, that it conjures up for you? Any, any thoughts? Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. I have that one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, another one that people come up with often is rambunctious. Um, any other thoughts? Energetic, absolutely. It like expresses a sense of, of energy in the world, going and doing things. Um, maybe lively, um, and even could be things kind of like trickster, trickstery, playful, flourishing. Like it, uh, it, when applied to nature, it often means like everything's just kind of growing and and uh, without control. Um, and it's a word that's been used. A, somewhat frequently recently in writings about what we can do regarding uh, the environment. There's a, a book called uh, Mobilizing the Green Imagination, an Exuberant Manifesto by Anthony Weston, um, and also the word rambunctious, uh, such as uh, Rambunctious Games, a Manifesto for Environmental Game Design, which is by Alinda Chang. So it's a kind of thought that's been on people's minds, uh, and it to me, it, it, it implies so much playfulness and uh, how we bring kind of this extra excitement and energy to, to what we do. Um, and for me right now, I really need that. I think that's why I was attracted to it. I've been, you know, it's been a really tough and depressing time. And having that extra enthusiasm and this feeling of kind of playful um, misbehavior almost feels really good to me, and it's something that I think resonates a lot with my work. So that's, that's why I am uh, exuberant. Um, so I promised I would give you a look at what I have done up to this point. Um, so I want to start off with, with an event called Gamma, which originally stood for Game Art Montreal, uh, that I curated along with my collective Kokoromi uh, at the time, which was we started around 2006. And uh, there was four of us in the group who were kind of basically like a band, but instead of making music, we were making video games and these events that would inspire people to make indie games and bring them into a social space. And what you see here are some images from a few different editions. We did four different editions, each one focusing on a slightly different interface technology. So. Um, one was using music uh, as a line in to create content in the game that you would interact with. Um, they, and you see here uh, uh, one of the bands that was playing that event. So the music that band is playing is actually generating the creatures on the screen behind it by taking the different um, like low, medium, and high-pitched notes and creating creatures, uh, different creatures out of those. Uh, another version we did Gamma 3D, which uh, was right around the time when a lot of uh, companies were trying to promote 
3D television as a thing you'd want, and we were trying to understand why that made any sense at all. And we went ahead and, and uh, decided to make a challenge about how could you make games that were actually stereoscopic. But instead of going with the sort of high-tech uh, things that, that the companies were trying to sell, we went really lo-fi and went to the what's called anaglyphic stereos stereoscopy with the red cyan uh, glasses and tried to see what people could do with that. And the answer was quite a lot. <laughs> um, but how could you really make it matter in the, inter in, in the in interaction rather than just a superficial, oh, that dinosaur looks really gigantic, like so... One of the games um, was like a maze game, but it used colors that could only be seen if you were wearing the glasses. So if you weren't wearing them, it just looked like almost like a Mondrian, just like a wall of colored squares. Worked really well. And um, the last one we did was uh, Gamma 4 One Button Games. Um, you know, controls for games are getting more and more and more complex, and I'm sure uh, most of you have played games that, like, if you haven't been playing them, like, since the series started and you tried to jump in at the end, there's just so many, uh, you know, commands and uh, different conditional controls that you have to learn for these things, and we were trying to look at what could you do with just the very bare minimum on-off one-button um, interaction, and how could you make that exciting for people? And the game that is on the screen here was called Brutally Unfair Tactics Totally Okay Now, otherwise known as Button. And um, the idea was that uh, there are four buttons, so it's a four-player, multiplayer game, and uh, each time a command would come on screen, it would be something like this one. First player whose button is held for seven seconds wins. And you, you had to be standing back from these, these buttons and then just sort of make a mad dash for it and try to see if you can hold your button for the longest while preventing anyone else from holding theirs. And as you can see from the picture that is so blurry that you can't even tell what's happening, it was, it was quite a scramble. Um, really, really cool game that was you know, meeting that challenge of it's only got one button for each player, but what can you do? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it was pretty genius. Um, so we held these events uh, roughly one every year or every other year for like seven or eight years and uh, kind of built up a culture of exposing um, experimental games in a, more like a nightclub setting. So people with drinks or that, that um, people meeting each other and just the social interaction you would get out of that was really interesting because people would not necessarily know how a game worked, but somebody next to them had just played it, and they would teach it to them. We made sure like, that all the games that showed in that were simple enough that, that you could get it without having to go through a tutorial or anything like that. So it was really games designed around this exact cultural situation. Um, OK, and uh, mentioned in the bio was uh, this particular piece, which is called the Oh My Bod app, um, started off as an app called Body Heat, and then got purchased by the company that makes the hardware, which is a, a vibrator, a sexual you know, toy that is um, driven by a musical beat. So um, you just turn, plug it into, say, like your, at the time, iPod, and it would generate <sighs> vibrations based on uh, the rhythm uh, and the different uh, frequencies of the music. And I thought that was really interesting. I was like, why can't I just control it directly instead of using a piece of existing music? Well, right around that time is when um, the, you know, the iPod Touch came out, which was like the precursor touchscreen device to the iPhone. And I was like, OK, perfect. Let's just make an app that actually uh, controls the, the vibrational patterns. And so it essentially took um, a multi-touch input and translated that into a sound wave that would directly uh, control the, the vibrator. Um, and the company that made the vibrator actually liked it enough that they were like, yeah, we want this. And so they bought it from me. And so now it's branded the Oh My Bot app. Though the version I worked on is like many generations ago. So I think that doesn't, doesn't look the same anymore. Um, and uh, the, uh, there's a lot of things I've done in uh, physical space, making physical space playful. Um, it, I call it here, you know, built environment. It's not only architecture, but it usually is inside an architectural building. Um, so uh, in 2012, I and two colleagues, Lynn Hughes and Cindy Perimba, 
uh, curated an exhibition in a building in Paris called the Gaîté Lyrique, and it's full of all these. Uh, it was built with many different uh, ways to interface technologically, like text streams running, and and uh, you know, not just internet everywhere, but but really. Um, the capability of doing uh, projections and things that all interconnected, and um, lots of different exhibition space. And we curated different artists from around the world who are doing interesting thing things with games to create installations that specifically took advantage of the, the space that they were assigned to. And the one that you see here in the background is called Kit Operette. It's by a group, Daily to le Jour. And um, in that one, it was, it was literally an opera, a mini opera, an operette. Um, and the background music was playing in a loop, but it didn't have any vocals. And if you wanted to hear the vocals, you would need to um, use these different uh, pieces of, of um, props, basically opera props that were in the room. And so you see here are these umbrellas, which were on a, on a kind of string. And you had to uh, twirl the umbrella to get a duet going between two different characters. It was really, really quite delightful. Um, and then other pieces you see here, one was called The Building Is by Hide and Seek. Uh, in the middle, uh, there's um, a piece called Ninja Shadow Warrior by Kaho Abe. Uh, and the last one is called Interference. It's uh, uh, and Eric Zimmerman and his partner, Natalie. Um, so uh, this was like a really interesting way to just take the physical space and make it into something that no one had seen before and really use to great a, as much possible advantage the, the technology that was built into the site. But I think the important thing I learned actually from this experience is um, the in, importance of the people that were working in this site. You, it, it wasn't really the kind of thing where you could just set up this tech and walk away. And also, people didn't really that came to visit didn't really know what was going on, and we, we gave them some some guides, but it was you know something that they'd never experienced before. It was a little bit mysterious, and so when we uh, created the exhibit, we uh, did a um, training session with the people that would normally be considered like the museum guards, you know, um, because they were the ones who were enlivening the space. If, if someone came by themselves and didn't have another person to play a particular game with, those people would step in or they would help explain what was going on. But they would also be kind of like actors in the mysterious role of, of uh, the building and its... And its um, in one room, there was actually like the a kind of the building's heart, which was like if you um, if you did enough of these different uh, small installations, you get access to the secret room, and and it was really important that the the people who worked there were helping helping people along in their quest to get to the building's heart. So it was really important to like involve those people not only um, informationally but kind of emotionally to want to play with with visitors and make that a good experience for those folks who came to to see it um, yeah mentioned previously the uh, super hypercube this is the the VR version of super hypercube the first version was actually using those red cyan glasses so it was mostly black and white um, but when the uh, you know, that last wave of um, most recent wave that we're still kind of in uh, of, of VR development came or was coming around, so maybe you know, mid 20 teens. Um, we uh, thought about, well, you know, people have been asking us to make Super Hypercube available uh, commercially. Up until now, it was only something you could show at, say, a party or um, an exhibition. Um, could we think about what we would do with it if we did have uh, full color and, and we had it like mounted on your head? And uh, so we just kind of went to this like retro futuristic dream of what was what did people think the internet was going to be or uh, before it existed? So around like the I guess l late '80s, early '90s vision of of um, you know, neon everywhere, and uh, we just kind of like went hard and and went ahead and, and just made that world. And so, um, the gameplay here is that uh, you are zooming through space, kind of behind that 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 green thing we call it the cluster of cubes, and you're zooming forward and trying to 
um, fit into the wall, which you can kind of see, it's very faint in the background actually in this image. I didn't think about how faint the, the wall is. But the, the wall has like a two dimensional projection of one side of that cube, of that cluster of cubes. And you're trying to, while you're zooming forward and, and it's getting faster and faster, you're trying to rotate your, the cluster so that you get it so that you've got exactly the right projection and you go through the, the hole in the right way and none of the other um, cubes will fall off. So um, there was a Japanese game show that a lot of people know. It was like Human Tetris, if that is familiar to anyone, um, where people would have to like, uh, the wall was coming toward them and they'd have to like do something like this and try to make it so that they didn't get thrown into a, into a um, pond of water or, or similar. And it was taking that experience and applying it to this uh, virtual space. And the important thing for us there is that the controls were very simple. You're really just rotating this cube, but the camera is, of course, controlled by where your head is. So you, to be able to see what your cube looks like and to see what the, um, the hole in the wall looks like, you'd really have to put your body into it and lean around, and, and it really meant something. It, it wasn't just, oh, I'm, I'm fixed in, in space and I have like a three, 360 movie around me. It really was very physical, and um, that was uh, important to us that we were using proprioception as a, a way to learn what we needed to know to be successful in that puzzle, um, a, full, a full body interaction, really important. Um, a project I did a few years back, Chair Jam, uh, with a, a group of students at the Entertainment Technology Center where I teach, um, was a, an effort to uh, really look at assistive technology not only as a functional thing, but also uh, as a more generative or expressive medium. Um, working uh, with artist Teresa Devine, we put together, uh, and she teaches at ASU, um, we put together um, a game jam, essentially, where we brought together uh, people from the Pittsburgh community and people from Carnegie Mellon and uh, actually held that um, with Patrick Carrington's lab in, in the HCI department um, at, at CMU. And um, the, we put everyone in small teams and their job was to work together with the other folks on the team, um, some of whom were using wheelchairs and some were not, to figure out how they can make something that uses the particular capabilities of that specific chair, because not everyone is, is the same, right? They have different, um, different affordances, um, and make those into some kind of playful experience. We didn't require it to be like a game with points or any, anything like that. It was, it, it was, some of them were more expressive, like artistic, like attaching um, paint brushes and putting paper on the floor and then using the chair to create artwork. Um, another one was kind of, and I think the team, I'm trying to remember if the team here was the one I'm thinking of, but one of the teams did a kind of laser tag game where the people that were, um, there were there were different kind of like armor that you were attaching, um, and uh, people would also have lasers that were pointing outward from either their chair or their body, and uh, there were different attachments you could use depending on whether you were in a chair or you were on your feet, and it was an attempt to try to um, get everyone playing in the same space because the laser could. Uh, you know, angle at a certain way to hit a, a receptor on the other person. So that's, that was their solution to that particular challenge. Another um, big strand of my research and creative practice is, uh, I'm calling it here, chemical senses. And I think mostly people would associate that with smell. It could also mean food, you know, eating is also chemicals. Um, but in, this, in uh, this particular realm, I've primarily worked with smell. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like, literally, how do you use your sense of smell in a digital uh, experience? And, or any kind of game, really. They didn't have to be game, you know, especially when I'm teaching, usually I'm not using digital technology to design games. But in this case, um, 
wanting to look at how to use um, your sense of smell as a way to play a game and not as a kind of uh, just scene setting thing. So, oh, you're running through a field and you smell flowers or uh, you're in a restaurant and you smell food. Like, there's some uh, different ways to use smell in, in uh, making an experience more rich, but what I was interested in, in looking at and in my interactive uh, career is how are these things actually used as part of gameplay meaningfully? So um, in the case of this particular game, it's called Guilty Smells. Um, you're playing this sniffing dog, and um, what you're trying to do is, and it's a very, it's a satirical, critical game, so um, be assured it, it's, it's done with a mind toward uh, the critique of the culture that it is representing, not to reinforce it. Um, and uh, you're playing this sniffing dog who's like basically a police dog. And uh, so you're sniffing for people that are eating un-American food. It, it takes place in a future that wasn't really very futuristic, to be honest. Um, and uh, the idea would be that if you smelled somewhat, smelled the, the wrong kind of food, then you would bark and um, basically it would send a SWAT team down to like, to, uh, uh, address the issue of, of someone eating so-called un-American food. And of course the joke is that like none of it was un-American food. Um, there were, but the, the way it worked is that this device, um, it, you can kind of see it, it's uh, in, in the corner, the like wooden uh, device with the four holes um, uh, was made by some students of mine uh, in Montreal and it's called the Death Whiff 3000. They made it for a zombie game. And it plugs into uh, your software, and it runs on, uh, you know, Arduino, and um, it can send out one of four different smells. And we used that, and I literally like took different kinds of food and put them inside of the the device. And when you um, went in this game, when you went up to a person that was, you know, sitting in the park, just minding their own business, um, uh, it would blow out air over one of these uh, containers of food and if you, you'd smell it, you could identify, you know, was it a hamburger, which is like in this uh, dystopian world, like the only approved food, um, or was it something else? And uh, so, so yeah, that was one of the more recent uh, incursions into trying to make the sense of smell uh, meaningful and uh, not just a sort of um, mood setting uh, sense. Uh, so then the pandemic. So that was like right before the pandemic. Um, the pandemic obviously hard on, on everyone. Um, uh, I went to remote teaching like many and like many of you all might have gone to remote learning if you were uh, already in school at that point. And uh, it was also just very hard on people physiologically, psychologically, um, and still is, you know. Um, and thinking about what could I do to try to share what I know about how human physiology is, uh, um, works and is maybe help people that might have a need to um, feel even a little bit better because like we were all stuck in our homes by ourselves. Um, a lot of events got canceled and, you know, helping people by sharing even a little bit of what I was learning at that point about somatics, which is uh, one of my areas of interest. Um, I wanted to make some kind of, of uh, presentation about that. So I developed this, you could call it a game or you could call it a, um, a performance really uh, called Protection Song. And the way I, I structured it was a, a kind of text, not a text adventure, but a text um, experience in the game making software Twine. Has anybody heard of Twine before? Um, it's like a narrative, um, you know, interactive narrative software uh, that's really simple to use and really accessible. Um, and I made a story that you can experience through Twine or experience through audio, uh, performance audio, 
about um, essentially being a small uh, prehistoric mammal, which is what we see here in the picture, um, named Aomaya. Um, and uh, it was taking people through an experience of being an early mammal. Like, where did we get this sensorium that we have of, you know, these horrible things are happening and we just kind of shut down and we go into like fight or flight mode or, um, you know, how did we get to be the way we are? Because a lot of people were kind of blaming themselves for, for the way that their, you know, feelings, the way they were reacting to the situation. And I kind of wanted to make the point that no, this is like how we as humans and as mammals essentially have been um, developed, you know, socially and um, physiologically for the, the way that we are reacting to this. It's totally normal that people are shutting down or, you know, changes in their in eating or things like that. And I also wanted to kind of, through the process of telling the story, bring people back to their senses. So there's, there's elements of this ta uh, presentation that actually are interactive with people needing to, like, have a little piece of a snack and a drink of water and doing some breathing exercises, and it really gradually takes you through all these things while telling you the story of uh, how these early mammals responded to their world. And that was, just felt like something I could bring, even though everyone's stuck on, on Zoom and watching things on, on YouTube, so. Um, yeah, <laughs> so getting up to current day, that was you know a bit of a of a fast run through, through my um, how am I doing for time? It's like eleven thirty. Okay, yeah, um, and you know, obviously it, it's no surprise to anyone that we've really got a, a crisis on our hands, and I especially know that people of you know your generation are extremely affected by this, and um, I'm myself, I'm Generation X, so um, you know, I feel so strongly for people that, that are having to deal with this when it isn't a problem they made, and that being you. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, I, it's hard to figure out what to do, and, and like, okay, here we find ourselves. Like, so many things that we took for granted, we are not able to take them for granted anymore, and doing so is, is hurting other people. So how do we handle that knowledge? Um, and everyone's gonna bring to that question what they have you know, to give. And in my case, I'm a game designer, as, as you've seen. Um, and uh, trying to think about how what I do is actually going to make uh, any kind of dent in, in that, like the, because there's, you know, all the, like, inf information that's overwhelming and uh, the inertia, the, you know, the state of uh, uh, economic reality and, you know, try to help uh, myself as well as other people not, not lose hope in the sight of all those things. Um, and, you know, people do say that games are, are good at certain things, like they are better than other kinds of media, like l maybe linear um, media at, you know, modeling systems, helping people understand what's going on uh, in a complex uh, scenario, um, or helping people ha give people an experience, like they actually feel like they're living it themselves. and. Um, they feel it very personally when, when they play a game. Um, it also creates identity. So many people form, uh, you know, a deep connection with worlds and characters and uh, take that outside of the game as well. And they also, I'm, I'm sure everyone here plays games with friends and games are really good at uh, creating community. So it seems really like that there are ways in which games could make a meaningful difference in the kinds of things we need to know to do to uh, address what's going on climate-wise. Um, and in fact, there are a number of organizations and entities that are making steps into this, and it's been happening, you know, it's been increasing over the last few years, um, just to name a few. Uh, one that is uh, maybe quite prominent right now is the, the IGDA, which is our, it stands for International Game Developers Association, so that's our professional organization, has a special interest group on climate, and they're doing a lot of, uh, and it's all volunteer work, but they're doing work to try to 
think of what are the techniques that games in particular can use to fight uh, climate change. And uh, they have recently released a playbook. And they're also working on getting like uh, the, the research behind all of these things uh, very clearly documented. Um, there have been a lot of game jams. Um, again, like a game jam being everyone sort of simultaneously working on a kind of thematic issue. And in this case, they were doing a climate game jam and uh, released a, a number of different people that were working in this jam released a number of different games recently. And there have been a few different ones. That's, you know, Games for Change is one of the bigger organizations for uh, transformational or meaningful games in our uh, space, and they've been organizing those as well as other groups have. There are like other media, like there's an entire podcast that's just about how can game developers fight climate change called Doing Our Bit. Um, so I wanted to mention that. And you know, the game companies are starting to see how important it is too. Hopefully it's not entirely greenwashing. Uh, you know, it depends probably on the company. And um, one that has been uh, making plenty of efforts is Unity, um, which you may all know from the Unity game engine. And so they've been doing uh, different fun funding different initiatives and events and, and trying to make progress on this. Um, and there's a growing body of, of written literature and uh, of like compiled lists of games that have climate uh, themes and a lot of effort for us to try to understand what everyone else is doing and, and learn best practices from that. Um, and for me personally, okay, I don't want to give any spoilers and you know, ha how many people have seen everything everywhere all at once? Anybody? A few? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to spoil it too too badly. It's it's such a beautiful movie, um, and I just saw it actually a few days ago while I was you know in the midst of writing this, and I was like, yes, that's exactly it. I don't know why I didn't you know from the first time I saw it, I didn't remember it, but um, in this particular scene, the main character Evelyn is putting a googly eye on her on herself, you know, and um, that might seem really ridiculous, and it kind of is, but that's that's pretty much the point that the movie is making at that point. Um, her husband, Waymond, uh, is someone who kind of uh, faces the world with playfulness and joy and um, kindness, and in the course of the movie, she is sort of starting to understand why he does the things he, the way he does. And, and you know, in this scene, Waymond asks, like, what are you doing? And she says, learning to fight like you. And for me, there, there, there's a scene after that that I won't describe, but it just kind of shows her fighting, but also giving people what they want. It's like her fighting is actually providing joy, and providing satisfaction to people in all these different individualistic ways. And so for me, that was really, uh, captured it because that's kind of like what I want to do. Like it'd be too easy for thinking about how games are going to fight climate change to get down a path of being really doomer. And you know, I don't want to be doomer, uh, but I want to be realistic, but not too serious, you know? Um, and so if there's, if we don't enjoy what we're doing and if people don't enjoy playing it, and if we don't actually enjoy the future, then what are we here for? So. That's, you know, joy and pleasure are an integral part of survival. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that this is like my, my role to play is, um, play is, is pretty much a rhetorical strategy, right? It, it's, um, you know, it generates kind of open-hearted interest in things. It, it makes people uh, lower their guard a bit and be more engaged. Um, people can be more, more curious or, or vulnerable. And uh, in addition to that, creating play, learning to design play, creates deeper engagement and understanding uh, of issues as well. So um, there's a lot of researchers that are working on why play works the way it does. And um, you all might yourself be uh, working on why interface has an effect on, on someone, um, positively or negatively. Uh, and uh, at, at, C at CMU, at the HCII, there are, are a lot of uh, folks working on thinking about also, like, what are the behavioral effects of people actually enjoying themselves, like being happy. Um, Jess Hammer is maybe the one who uh, is most prominent in that, and then others that are working along with her. Oh, and since it isn't really obvious, um, this is from a kind of, not a game jam, but a um, 
I was prototyping a game that actually taught people how to tie different knots, like, like nautical or other kinds of knots, and could they do that collaboratively. And uh, while I was at a Games for Change, Change Festival in Australia a few years back, um, I just prototyped that one interaction to see how, how people picked up on that. And I'm thinking of actually re resuscitating that one. I haven't done with anything with it since then, but, but I've gotten inspired by this finding these pictures and talking to myself about these issues to perhaps pick, pick that up again. Um, yeah, and you know, play gets people to actually move and to go out in the world and do things. And uh, it's one of the few media that actually, you know, part of fulfilling and participating and experiencing the work is that you can actually go and physically do a thing. You're, you're not passive at all. Um, and uh, so I, you know that is a really important thing if you're trying to actually get people to act on uh, their environmental beliefs. And so I think um, this is something that, that I want to bring into the work in this particular space. The example I have here is called the Dance Singularity. <laughs> and um, it was an event that uh, Kokoromi did where, um, a little bit hard to see, but there is a, a square dance mat, uh, dance floor, made of nine DDR dance pads, so uh, like a you know, three by three. And um, each one of those three by three uh, dance squares um, is linked to the, the display you see on the screen there. Um, but it's also linked to a, a kind of VJ setup. So off to the left there are on the stage, you can see me, I'm like controlling the, the VJ thing. And the idea was if we can get everyone to dance as you know, um, much or as good or you know, as uh, excitedly as they can, that perhaps we can achieve the dance singularity and the idea was that when you know there was the drop in the music, it would make this kind of like explosion in the, the graphics. But meanwhile, the audience is like you know there is already that natural thing when you're at a, a dancing that people get more excited as you get close to the rising tension and the music than like the drop kind of like is the you know happy explosion. Um, we were just playing with that and making it also a thing where there seemed to be seemed to be a literal connection between the, what the dancers were doing and achieving this kind of like, um, you know, catapulting into a new reality. Um, so, you know, the making something like this, making interaction actually pleasurable is uh, the thing that, you know, I think I want to take from projects like this, like making activism playful. Um, so the, the way that we've been doing some work so far at, at uh, CMU is like pulling together the research on the impact of like creating games and how that actually changes uh, people's beliefs. And um, the thing, things that happened just really recently, um, working on a, with a grant from Unity on a green game design pedagogy, so working on how we can use teaching game design through making games that are expressing things about you know, the environment or about uh, nature. Um, and uh, also taking some time to look at the, the psychological and sociological research behind these, uh, behind what makes green games work, so we can actually say, is this worth it? You know. Um, and then on the right, uh, it, next semester, I'll have a team of students that, that actually they developed their concept uh, independently to create a game um, that's a echotopia. Echotopia. How does it? How do we live in an, uh, in the future after things have changed? But through the fact that we have come together as uh, you know humanity to deal with the problems, not necessarily fix them, but maybe some of them fixed, and then some having to just kind of live with, and um, tying that into the. Um, some, I guess, three or so of the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is what those, those three icons represent. And they're focusing on things like localized production and renewable energy and things like that and developing a game prototype this next semester. Um, okay, almost to the end of the time. 
Um, yeah, so this, is, this it kind of wraps up what I'm looking at games doing, and the way I think of it is a game design for an exuberant future, and the important thing is that it's making things that we do together as, as a community. Um, in the research uh, I was looking at, I'm really um, following a lot of the work of Adrienne Marie Brown, who you might have heard of, an uh, activist who wrote the book Pleasure Activism. And um, I really appreciated the um, thought that she had in an interview recently. Um, and I'll just read you a quote from her. It's like, the work of changing the world has a million front lines. It's lifelong work, growing your own soul. And I think the most radical way to approach it is to cultivate collective agency, she says. Learn to transform your behaviors. Learn as a collective how to transform our behaviors. And um, my thoughts personally is that uh, games and game design are some of the most powerful ways we, we have to do that. Thanks. Zoom or otherwise? I do. Okay. <laughs> um, you were talking about like that smell, that game. Yeah. Um, and I realized that there's not a lot of that is yeah, there's not a lot of games that talks about smell. No. Uh, is there any future progression on that game itself, or do you know anything about that in the industry? Because I feel like uh, the industry has utilized all types of senses except for smell, and it's a difficult one to tackle, but mm -hmm. it is the one that's more sensorial with vision as well, with visual. Right. Yeah, so what are your thoughts about it? Right, so the question is, um, how, are there other games that work with smell, and, and how widespread is it, or how possible is it? That's a huge question. I did spend um, a lot of time on some other projects as well, and like really digging into what smell could do. There have been, in the past, various points, um, attempts to make sort of off-the-shelf things that could be used in the home as a like device next to the computer. Um, and as you might imagine, most of them were really uh, underwhelming, you know. Part of it is that it is chemically based, so the actually getting the materials you need and getting them into a device that can then distribute them um, usually limits people, uh, you know, it, it's not an economically viable thing to do in most cases for an off-the-shelf, in-the-home type thing. It is way more common in things like experience design, like a theme park or retailing or things like that. Um, and the other thing is that those uh, smell components that go into uh, a device would have a shelf life, so they don't last, you know, they could de decompose. Or they're made out of something that's so... Uh, artificial that they just kind of smell bad and then there's the fact that people have different associations with different smells and it's not always that you know a good smell smells good sometimes my people develop memory uh, you know, it's obviously known to have strong associations with memory but people maybe you know like maybe uh, they smell roses but it makes it makes it think of somebody that was really mean that wore rose perfume and you know like it, it doesn't mean there's never a one-to-one -one, um, mapping of smell to you know to and, and because it has such a visceral reaction for people that's important obviously that's true of everything and then some people are allergic to certain chemicals and certain smells and like I I, I gave a whole talk um, I could go on and on I love talking about it um, the other project I did with smell was a little more, a little more simplistic but fun. Was called Sugar, and in that you play a um, performing horse, and uh, there were different smells that would um, be delivered based on your performance in, in the. Uh, it's basically a stadium, and um, if you were doing well, then you would get a very sweet sugary smell. Uh, kind of middling was you'd get a grassy sort of smell. And when the horses uh, messed up their performances, they would poop, and then there was a poop smell that I made out of horse poop. So it <laughs> didn't smell that bad, actually. <laughs> it sounds like gross, but it wasn't. It wasn't as bad as it sounds. But I like horses, so um, yeah. So, and I've taught classes where I've had students working to try to experiment further with with making meaningful 
um, interactions with smell, it's very tough. Um, it's fun, it's so fun, but it's really complicated. So there, I think that's the main reason, like those are some of the main reasons why it hasn't been more, more yeah, common. It sort of restricts it to more like uh, a physical or analog product, and that's it. That, that is yeah. probably the best use case, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have two questions on Zoom. Okay. Um, the first one is from. We are unmuted. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we hear you. Hey. Sorry, I couldn't hear you say yes. Weird. Um, hi, I also have a question about the smell study that you did with being a dog, and I was curious if you could speak to or if you think that there are any um, ethical concerns or the reinforcement of biased opinions by putting people in a game that's supposed to be the near future, and then like awards points by arresting people for not eating hamburgers that are dubbed as like the only American food in the game. Um, yeah, I would say there are ethical concerns. That's uh, you know something after making the satirical game, we realized that not everyone would understand what, what it meant. So I wouldn't call it research, though. It was a piece of art. So there are slightly different constraints about what it can or should do. But uh, yeah, I feel like what I learned from that is you know like there, not everyone is going to receive it in the same way. It's, it's clearly could be very troubling. So even though a lot of satirical artwork is, you know, it's when you're working in that territory, uh, it's like, how do you communicate best that something isn't promoting the thing that it's satirizing? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that, you know, putting uh, warnings on things or other ways of contextualizing it or having, you know, in the, for instance, in the other thing I did with the um, being a, a a prehistoric mammal, you know, there's some scenes in that which are could be scary. And even for that, which was a later work, I put in like a pre-care um, document and an aftercare document. And so I think if I were to go back and do something again, like the the um, guilty smells, that I would be a lot more careful to try to address what the obvious, you know possible issues are around around the like violence that was de depicted in that particular piece. Thank you. Um, our second question is from You're unmuted. Hi, can am I audible? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, oh cool. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask um, there are a lot of these uh, movements in green games, as you've mentioned. Uh, there, have there been any kind of key performance indicators or like examples where you know, aha, we've we've done it, we've we've made a dent in the world, as you say, and kind of um, if there are, well, what are the like most impactful ones? Do you say? I don't know the answer yet, and one thing that uh, <clears throat> is happening right now is a, a literature review. So there are uh, researchers at uh, CMU and the HCII um, that are doing that exact thing. They'll be working on it this summer to try to see what we can find and then see where the, the gaps are to try to address some of that. Um, so that's the short answer, is that probably there are some. Uh, it, you know, people are working to pull that together to make that a, a resource. I'm coming personally from uh, more the practitioner space, and so uh, I'm not directly involved in that research, but I'm collaborating with the folks that are doing that. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that one? Yeah. Because um, I'm very curious about... How are you setting up the, the goals for the green games? Are you thinking about changing people's attitudes, clarifying disinformation, trying to get them yeah. to change behaviors? Right. Um, all of those things could be possible. I think it's you know a case by case basis. There are there is some really good um, literature on the for practitioners for develop game developers that want to make change through games. One is called the Transformational Design Framework by Sabrina Solba. Um, there are others that, that are also attempting to uh, you know, put into actionable form how to do you know, 
create a, a change in perspective or a change in knowledge, even just dis, uh, determining what kind of change you want to make, you know, and then helping. So um, yeah, it's there's maybe not entirely separate literatures for those who are are researching, uh, you know, and using, you know, more methodological rigor and those who are trying to see how can we actually use that like I want to make a thing and I uh, you know how do I actually implement that so there is some crossover um, but right now is like a very fertile field in case anyone's interested in researching that now would be a really good time to to figure out a good question that you could tackle more I see one back there Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, so you've been working on a lot of different projects, and it seems like all your um, research projects or game ideas are at the intersection of, are, of a lot of different fields. And I was wondering, uh, so my question is twofold, I guess, is first, how do you come up with these ideas? And second, when you have these ideas, how do you start, I mean, how do you learn about these, di this, these different fields? And mm -hmm. how do you collaborate with other people? Um, it's different for everyone. Okay, that's always an interesting question when I hear other people get asked that. Um, often for me, it's it's kind of like a there's a Venn diagram in my head of like seeing that there's some things that I know about uh, that I think it's obvious that they overlap and that they're related or that there could be something interesting in that intersection, but nobody seems to be doing it and I'm like well I guess it's gonna have to be me <laughs> um, that's how a lot of those things happen and then you know in terms of things like the the smell or like proprioception and dancing and stuff like that I'm, I'm kind of a hedonist so like things that, that I want to participate in like I don't know singing or, or um, you know eating food or stuff like that I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how can I make my practice actually make that a thing that's more likely for me to get to do and help other people do as well. So I'd say that's maybe where they come from. And then do you have a second part to your question that I missed? Yeah, um, how do you learn about these, these fields? Mm -hmm. And do you collaborate with other people or everything? Yeah, um, I'd say I'm a pretty voracious learner. And um, I am not afraid to walk up to a random person who might and it's usually not walk up to, it's usually send an, a very, very elaborately written email to um, a person who's doing something that seems interesting. And many people, of course, would love to talk about th their work to people who are excited about it. And of course, sometimes just saying the word games gets people in interested and it opens doors. Um, so that's how I've mainly done that. And also just kind of putting out there what my interests are. I've, uh, the project I was mentioning with uh, Teresa Devine happened because I was really interested in, in um, you know, somatics and movement and motion and um, how those relate to disability, um, but looking at it from a very different perspective. And I happened to mention that in a talk like this at the end. I was like, and here's the stuff I like to do. And you know, she was there at my talk. And she just raised her hand, much like you are sitting here now, and was like, do you want to collaborate on that? And I'm like, yes. So, so that's, that's kind of how those things happen is, is by you know, putting it out there, putting out a tweet if, if that's what you do or, you know, whatever the way you reach out. Um, and then, um, you know, being unafraid to talk to people but also respecting their time. So, you know, not, not uh, going, uh, not taking up more than some of someone's energy than, than is fair for, to expect them to give. So that would be how I would manage it. Um, I I was wondering because you kind of talk about games in slightly two ways for me. Like um, you're thinking about like the impacts of the game um, and what kind of emotions or behavior it might like instill in people. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, um, there's like for you, game is also art. Um, and I wonder if like because I think for the dog sniffing game, I feel like there was like uh, a, an opposition between those two things mm -hmm. because you're trying to 
be able to like map your art, but at the same time, you're facing you know reports about um, how people are impacted by this game. So I was wondering like how do you, especially when designing um, serious games, like how do you reconcile those two things? Wow, yeah, that's a tough one. How and the question is how do I reconcile? Maybe do I reconcile my uh, interest in games having an impact and games being a free expression of like an artistic, um, you know, or crit critical perhaps, um, or other kinds of artistic expressions. Usually, it um, depend. It's a break broken down a little bit by which project it is. Some of them are more intentionally intended to be. Uh, games that have an effect, and others, um, it's not as clear that I'm making a, a you know, a transformational game. Um, I think maybe that's you've kind of put you know hit the nail on the head because I think like part of what I'm saying to myself <laughs> today is that it, I I don't want to make transformational games that don't also have some feeling of uh, you know, joy or um, that don't maybe um, seem not magical, but just I want them to have to, people to have feelings other than, oh yeah, I just learned about the polar bears. You know, like I want it to actually feel like they're in a narrative or they're in a world and then have that also somehow reach them uh, either intellectually or, or in action. Because that's like the best art does that, right? We, it's, it's maybe not as studied, and we're not, we're not um, holding art to specific requirements in terms of the way it leads you to behave in a certain way. But that art will do that. It'll make you feel things. And then out of those feelings, you may take actions and so I think for my practice, I'd like those to be more uh, com combined than they currently are. Is that answered somewhat? It, it definitely does like spark. Mm. 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 Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know how much more time we have, but there's one over here. Yeah, we have one more minute, but I bet, okay. we, could, I bet we could get one more question in. So I, I'm wondering, like, for climate change specifically as a problem, like, there's this big asymmetry between people in the developed world who are producing more emissions and people in the developing world who will probably bear the brunt of the impacts. Mm. And I'm, I'm wondering how you think about that when you're choosing uh, how to intervene with games and, like, what, what the goals of the games are. It, because it seems like most of the projects are targeting people in, like, the, North America. In the developed world. Well, those are definitely the ones who are causing most of the issues, and therefore it's very valid to target uh, the um, developed world. Um, I think so far, and I can only speak to what I've done so far um, with, you know, in the, for instance, in the, in the class I was uh, talking about developing for this next fall, um, it, some of the, the photo that was there was actually based on uh, an assignment in the intro to game design class that I just taught, and the way we a, you know, worked on the climate topic is by involving local, meaning Pittsburgh, uh, ecological and environmental organizations. So it was hyper local. It wasn't even just like, oh, let's talk about North America or you know Pennsylvania or whatever. It was like really like, and that's where people have the most capacity to act. And um, so that seemed like a reasonable thing. And also because we were really excited that the people in those groups might want to, you know take that, what we made, and actually use it somehow, and, and some of them are. Um, so, yeah, and I think, though, maybe to your point, what is important to me is that not everything in this space is actually on a screen. There needs to be things that don't rely on certain forms of technological, you know, uh, excess or, you know, privilege. Uh, there have to be ways to get the the games more widely distributed and um, but I, I totally think that that tackling people who are in a position to make a bigger impact on you know the change um, by changing not only what they do personally but what their governments do is is you know very important so yeah. 
our time is up, and please uh, join me thanking our guest today. Thank you.